Hi, my name is Kate Buchanan and I'm the Specialist Editor for Conciliation Resources Accord Publication number 29 in 2020. The focus of this publication is on early and preformal or formative phases of peace processes. We're interested to learn more and explore how pathways to peace are built and sustained. And we decided to focus on this particular aspect of peacemaking because it's quite underexplored and poorly understood, partly because of the necessary confidentiality and discretion that is associated with this phase, but also because the nature of peacemaking is changing so rapidly. The Accord has dozens of contributors, either as authors or peer reviewers, individuals who are negotiators, mediators, advisors, advocates, analysts, researchers, government officials and donors. Across the Accord you will see that it is organised around three categories. The first is thinking about changes in contemporary peacemaking and the ways in which conflict parties and civil society engage in early and formative peacemaking. The second part of the Accord focuses on contemporary peace practice and includes some case studies from Afghanistan, Myanmar and southern Thailand. And the final part of the Accord looks at innovations and new methods and technologies including digital analysis and social media as well as different ways of thinking about peace processes, ecosystem thinking and community-based approaches from northern Kenya and northern Syria, along with some of the dynamic ways in which young people are influencing peace processes and peacemaking. We also learn of a really exciting effort in the heart of Europe to promote disarmament by a small third-party mediation support organisation. It has become much harder to understand um, when wars end and peace begin. Uh, in all this complexity and this fuzziness and lack of linearity, what can um, external peace intervention do to understand you know, when and how they can support these uh, very early dialogue processes? Well, one of the things that can be done is really to have a sort of quite inclusive um, political analysis of the situation that's really ongoing, right? Not waiting for these moments, the kind of very elusive, ripe and ready moment. That really looks at um, all the belligerents, tries to understand where they're at, but not just in terms of their reality and the facts, but also their perception of what's going on. So whether those are political like leadership changes or generational shifts within an armed group or whether those are more about the military and the battlefield realities. It's not just the facts in themselves but also how each conflict party understands those realities. A second key element is about how do you foster the idea of a political exit and a strategy. And here a lot can be done to support whether those are civil society actors engaging with uh, the most isolated actors um, in dialogue or um, helping to foster internal coherence on both sides um, and getting them to really be able to engage with each other and strategize politically. Now, one of the key, key hindrances um, for this type of engagement is of course um, prescription regimes, so when armed groups are listed as terrorist organizations. Because by vilifying these armed groups, you're effectively taking the option of dialogue off the table. So what you're doing is really, um, you're kind of really raising the entry cost for early dialogue um, and negotiation. And at the same time, you're emboldening and encouraging the state, the government, to continue in its military strategy because it has uh, very little incentive to shift tracks and um, engage in dialogue. So here a lot can be done um, to um, sort of try and reduce as well this asymmetry 
between the government and the armed group because they're going to be very differently able and ready to engage in these dialogues and negotiations. And here it's not necessarily the same actors um, who should be engaging with both um, or at different levels. Um, sometimes it can be really useful to have a, a strategic division of labour um, between uh, different sort of external peace supports. Um, to try and, um, and foster uh, both this um, internal coherence within each party, but also help them those moments of early dialogue between the parties. context of Myanmar where armed conflict is protracted and there are multiple peace processes, conflicting parties find it challenging to speak with one voice. From the start of the ethnic armed conflict back in 1948, Myanmar government is perceived that conflict as domestic conflict. Therefore, traditional international third party mediation has never been considered as an option in Myanmar peace negotiation. The participation or engagement of the international third party would be perceived as interfering the domestic affairs. But there was a very limited international third party participation in the Myanmar peace process during the firstly elected democratic government rulings in period uh, back in 2010 and 2015. Meanwhile, the role of local and national as insider mediator has been increasingly important and has become crucial in the current peace process. Their efforts in creating and nurturing pathways for the peace process has often been not recognized and has been overlooked by many actors in the process. They work in a very lonely position and sometimes they will be perceived as disloyal to their own. Insider mediators work discreetly and work informally outside of the formal negotiation process. A challenge that they face is keeping trust with all parties in the conflict. Myanmar conflict being complex and restricted and limited to the international actors. The international actors had been uh, allowed to participate as advisor to the peace process, donor to the peace process, agency to provide capacity building, capacity training, seminar to the relevant stakeholder in the process. So in that context, we have to bear in mind that always to put the local, national in a driver's seat. In addition, there is also a need to further collaboration and coordination among the international actors engaged in the Myanmar peace process. The Somali region of Ethiopia, also known as Ogaden, has a long history of conflict, uh, insurgency and counterinsurgency. Decades of fighting has left Ogaden, one of the Ethiopia's poorest regions. Since 1984, the Ogaden National Liberation Front on the left, which is the latest of a series of insurgency groups in the region, has been struggling for self-determination for Somalis in the region. We were trying to, to go to another way so we can have talks with the Ethiopian government so we can have another route or another way that we can change from the fighting to the peace talks. It's very important to build the capacity of um, weaker elements uh, in any conflict to, to allow them to acquire the means and the methods to be able to sit at the table and argue for their case. 
for example, if we have issue to uh, discuss about the security, they will bring uh, anywhere from the world a security expert. We try to understand the constitution of Ethiopia. They bring lawyers which have uh, a knowledge to the constitution. But we learn it's possible. Negotiations are complex. You have to have a clear vision. You have to prepare your, your talking points, and also you, you need to uh, you need to understand between your demands and needs, and you know what's possible. So through the long journey we took together, we learned a lot, and we almost see a learning something from us. We trust people you don't trust. And usually what we believe is when you trust people, they, they also give you back. And from the beginning, we are very genuine and they are been very, very forthcoming. And so we trust them with our lives, with our future, with our secrets. We knew that supporting the official peace talks is key in ending the conflict. But we also knew from our experiences in supporting other peace processes across the world that including wider society in the peace process is vital for ensuring that the peace process sticks and is also credible. So alongside our support to the formal talks, we worked with young people, women, elders, diaspora, academics, former government officials who lived in exile in Nairobi, to ensure that their views on the peace process, as well as on the wider politics in the region, are included in the formal talks. <laughs> dalinyartu waa wax la dagaal gelinayo hadii iyo ku ay wax fahmaana waxa meesha ka dhalanayso dalinyartu in aysan dagaalamin oo ay fahmaan nabadda wanaageeda ay leedahay marka taal ajliye dalinyartu waa qaybta ugu muhiimsan ee keeni karto nabad iyo xasilooni waarto inuu yeesho dalku ama deegaanka inclusion is important uh, because first of all conflict comes out of exclusion it's the fact that people feel uh, they're excluded, uh, they're not part uh, of um, their power process, that they're not uh, uh, active participants in making uh, decisions affecting their lives. The mothers in Ogaden, they lost everything. Their rights, their lives, their daughters, their sons. So they, there must be a member or a woman in the team, you know. So it is very important actually. Mm. The peace deal was a historic moment after so many years of negotiations. It brings to an end the armed insurgency in the Somali region. But a peace deal is not the end of a peace process. It's a journey. We're now working with the parties to implement the deal and begin the process of reconciliation and addressing the root causes of the conflict in the region. We will uh, see them as uh, not as enemies, but as our, our competitors. And we will work with them in that regard. The advice we give to them is that peaceful political struggle is now the way forward for this region. We have seen where uh, the conflict has taken our people. So collectively, let's work together. And uh, it doesn't matter uh, who is in the opposition and who is in government. We only have one country, we only have one people. And therefore, what unites us is more than what divides us. We should work in that spirit. Greetings. My name is Vlad Korbu. I'm Chief Program Manager at the Dialogue Advisory Group, or DAG which is a mediation organization based in the Netherlands. And between 2011 and 2017, I was part of the DAG team, which helped verify ETA's ceasefire in the Basque country, and then disarm ETA. This was an important moment as it brought an end to what was considered the last autochthonous armed group in Europe. Yet what was most remarkable about this process was that it was a unilateral one. It happened without the participation of the Spanish government. In the absence of central government involvement, 
a number of actors emerged to make disarmament possible. This included Basque regional authorities, such as the Basque government and Basque political parties, which provided political leadership and public legitimacy for the verification and then the disarmament process. This also included Basque civil society organizations in Spain and in France, which injected ideas and momentum into these processes. Some of them also took on very direct risky operational roles, for instance, in receiving the location of ETA's weapons. Finally, this also included unofficial international organizations, such as the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue or the International Contact Group, which provided the international counterpart to which ETA could respond to. Amongst these, my own organization, DAG, set up the International Verification Commission, which monitored ETA's ceasefire. This was also an unofficial body, which made it easier for the Spanish government to tolerate its activities, yet it was made up of people with undeniable technical expertise, which made it credible and put it beyond suspicion of partiality. The Commission worked publicly and collectively, engaging all the relevant stakeholders in the Basque country. At the same time, the Commission maintained a firm but fair relationship with ETA. It helped explore and explain what was politically feasible in Spain at the time, and it took on some risky political and legal steps, for instance, in witnessing the first sealing of ETA's weapons. This created trust and made the Commission a reliable counterpart in ETA's disarmament. However, this was not an easy process. There were plenty of challenges that we faced along the way that we did not expect. For instance, the Commission was faced with intense, highly politicized media scrutiny, which it was ill-prepared to deal with. The Commission also struggled to manage public expectations in the Basque country of a swift disarmament process. And simple engagement with an armed group which was proscribed and operating clandestinely was practically and legally difficult. Of course, this was a unique process and a unique situation. However, I believe it holds some very valuable lessons for other situations, particularly those where official engagement might be practically or politically difficult. I invite you to read more about these lessons and about other creative pathways for peace in the latest Accord publication. Peace secretaries have great potential to support the early stages of a peace process. They are usually being set up by a conflict party to support their negotiating team during formal talks, so they are set up when an official peace process is just about to begin. But sometimes they come in also earlier, and this can be very useful. I'm thinking about five roles here. First of all, signaling. By setting up a peace secretariat, a conflict party shows that they are committed, they demonstrate their resolve, and this can increase confidence in the overall process. Secondly, a peace secretary provides access to the conflict party. This can be essential for non-state armed groups that usually are not easily to be contacted. It's important for the facilitators, diplomats, but also for the media. Thirdly, they help with increasing preparedness. First of all, in the secretarial way, by taking notes, making arrangements for flights and transport, logistics, these are essential functions and shouldn't be underestimated in supporting the negotiating team. But also, they can help by preparing position papers and background information. This is an important entry point, by the way, for enhancing the capacities and skills of the conflict parties for talks. And lastly, since they are not the official negotiators and they are in the second row, they can also be part of informal efforts like track two dialogue events or other efforts to bridge divides and help, for example, when peace talks are stalled. First of all, the peace secretary needs a proper mandate. To take on all the roles that I mentioned before, they need to be mandated to do so. They cannot just choose their own tasks. 
it's important to understand their character. They're not part of civil society, but they're established by the conflict party's leadership to support the negotiators. So they will only do what they're told to do. Secondly, they need qualified staff and resources, of course, and this can be an entry point for capacity building or funding by external actors. But you have to be careful about ownership because the peace secretariat must not be seen to be influenced by outsiders. This can be a real risk to the overall peace process. And thirdly, they need to consider their role in the wider landscape or infrastructure for peace, if you will. There are, of course, personal connections and networks of the staff of the Secretariat, but really the Secretariat as an organization has to consider its role in this wider landscape. Uh, there has to be cooperation and consultations, but also clarity of role. Um, since they're not part of civil society, it's important that they cannot push for peace outside their mandate. Kano Caravan is an annual trek along the river Ewasa Niro in northern Kenya. Using this shared natural resource as a connector, we facilitate dialogue among the various communities living along the river. They can use this space to meet each other, to showcase their various cultures, or to discuss the problems affecting them living along that river. Having a space to interact creates encounters among the various communities living along the river. This already serves to contribute to peace and uh, non-violent co cohabitation of the area by providing a space where stereotypes can be reduced, shared and common problems with the river can be discussed such as water blockages, varying water levels along the river, infrastructure projects being built. But furthermore, it can create friendship, so it can create also connections, so in case of erupting conflict, people from either side of the conflicting parties have sort of a lifeline so that they can talk with each other and hopefully amicably resolve these conflicts in time. The Kemla Caravan has been conducted since 2013 and thus far the effects have been manifold. It has become a household name in the region that means interaction and showcasing between various communities. But also it opens an entryway for politicians and other representatives of the state to interact with those communities, to listen to their problems and thereby to really build on that one. In 2019, we worked together with the Minister of Environment of the Republic of Kenya. In 2020, we worked together with the River, Ranch, River Management Authority, ENDA. And in doing so, the advocacy work that has been done for so long is slowly being translated into political goodwill and hopefully enforcement and legislation soon. Kemla Caravan is a space of interactions among communities and between communities and formal representatives of the state. It is thereby a gateway between the informal and the formal. It can help to translate informal agreements into state-acknowledged political agreements, legislation and enforcement thereof. Regardless of where you are, what parts of peace processes that you work on, where you live, what you do, we hope that you find something of interest across the accord and really welcome your feedback on the ideas, the suggestions and the analysis that you will find within it.